Welcome to our ComposeCast, where we discuss productivity, self-hosting, career professionalism, and innovative technology. Here to bring you the latest from the open source ecosystem and beyond is yours truly, Andrew Syriac, and with me is my co-host, Jack Moore. How are you doing today, Jack? Oh, I'm doing well. Uh, I think I'm doing a lot better than everyone who's mitigating against Log4j right now. How are you doing over there? Yeah, I uh, I am looking into that too, but luckily have not had that become my day to day. So, but for those who have had that become their day to day, it's been quite overwhelming. Um, so I hear. Yeah, so discovered in China. I'll leave that statement at that. Discovered in China by I guess some developers at Alibaba. Um, the Apache log4j library has an exploit, right? Who would have thought in logging, you're going to be able to remotely execute code, but I guess somehow, some way we've done it. Uh, I love, I, I posted this updated show note link, show notes link here, if you want to take a look, but essentially it's boiled down in very layman's terms. Um, what it looks like is basically log 4j the log the way logging the logging is occurring or happening what's happening is log 4j uses a ton of variables for dates uh they used a name as an example and it just kind of injects them in to logs mm-hmm. when the application is you know printing out logs to the console well sure enough these variables can basically be exploited uh i did have one high level content thing right here uh as a i loved this quote of basically describing how a code base works and this is why i said it's very layman's and i'm gonna read it right here imagine you have the task of making coffee for your partner every morning a simple task on the face of it but breaking it down you need more and more components you need a cup you need water hot water you need coffee and you may need milk and sugar And then it says, you don't go to the pottery and make a new cup every morning, nor do you milk a cow or pick and dry coffee beans and then grind them up. You certainly don't pump water from a well, heat it, and then combine everything. That would be incredibly time and labor intensive. Instead, if you're like most people, you buy a remade remade cup, buy prepackaged coffee, milk, and sugar. You turn on the tap for pre-filtered water. You combine them in a matter that suits your, your needs. So... I I love that code example just because people don't realize, yeah, you're taking code from everywhere. And unfortunately, what happened is Apache just published exploitable code. So that's kind of what we're looking at and remediating against remediating against right now. So Yeah, no, I, I certainly appreciate you reading that. That that kind of puts it into context, you know, what is a library? A library is, you know, someone else's work uh, that, that you can appropriate to do the work that you need to do. Um, Now, why a piece of login software uh, needs to be executing remote code is beyond me. It shouldn't. Uh, However, you know, this is just, you know, I was was thinking, I I actually heard this discussed in two separate podcasts of mine already. Um, But I was was thinking about it going through it. I'm like, look, the amount of complexity that modern software development has is like putting together like one of those Lego sets that you get that's like, you know, a bajillion amount of pieces and it's like part of like other sets like and and what these security researchers do is they try to find inaccuracies like if someone used a a slanted piece as a little workaround instead of a, a a fully square piece and therefore some kind of like mutant ant that's three times smaller than the regular ant can get into this one little crack right and we got security researchers breathing down our throats saying look this this uh, mutant ant type thing can get in here i'm like well we have you know anti-ant you know we've we sprayed the house <laughs> for ants so there's not going to be any ants like we have mitigating factors in place um but we we see these brought to our attention so often because people are brought brought to the center it's so low level and ingrained in what we're doing it's like look, i get it like i i, I get oh, that yeah. there's a possibility this could be exploited but the you know th- that's that's probably not going to be happening um unfortunately when when stuff like this comes around it's like someone just you know knocked a hole in your battleship kind of thing so it's a it's a it's a different 
if it's a, it's a different perspective on this. Totally. And with this receiving a what is it, the miter score of ten out of ten on the severity yeah. level, uh, I would recommend going out and patching or just auto fixing. I even saw a tweet out there that said, uh, "I'm not a developer, but I'm." writing code right now to fix basically this vulnerability just going in the code base and disabling logging <laughs> i heard that uh cloudera is taking the approach to uh, go through their software stack they, they have written a script that they're pushing out to customers that goes through their software stack and every single jar that they find in their software stack they decompile they take out the class they like remove the vulnerable class recompile it into the jar and then replace the old jar with the the new one that's impressive yeah uh, it, it really is impressive. it really is uh and and unfortunately you know a lot of the talking points around this is is going to be that yeah, it's it's deployed everywhere which is unfortunate um the the other talking point is going to be you know why wasn't this you know funded right and and uh ironically enough uh, in one of the Jupiter Broadcasting podcasts, uh, I think it was their their systems administration podcast. They were talking about, well, just c- create a community of NFT holders that you know, are incentivized to. And I was like, well, we're going to stop there and uh, hang on. We'll talk about that later. But you know, that being a foreshadowing into what we're going to dive into in our, our grab bag, you know, there is this conversation happening about um, how can we fund the kind of research and development that needs to happen, you know, because going back to the Lego analogy, you have people putting together these amazing looking sets. I mean, you got like the Death Star, you've got, you know, all these, I, I just remember that one vividly, but like, you know, all these complicated Lego sets, I guess the Millennium Falcon 2 was pretty intense but imagine if someone put out those plans for free right um how would you kind of incentivize them to make sure that there weren't any issues with it right or that it didn't degrade over time or was structurally you know something something bad could happen to it how how do you how do you give them the opportunity to take their time and be cautious about it and, and give them a good ecosystem to operate within you know and and a lot of that has to do with incentivization and and how they how they monetize what they're doing and and a lot of this conversation has shifted to be around that well this would have been found you know were we to have um taken everyone who is uh, using open source as a a back end to to contribute back to it and and it's like yeah, that's that's great in in idea, but um, you know, people are using so many different things. It's it's hard to say where to start. Um, and that's something that we've tackled as well. We're like, you know, where where do we start with this? And 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 from the get go, we're like, w- w- you know, Jack, you and I both believe in open source software, right? And and we we saw this too. We're like, well, pff, there's all these applications that aren't, you know, they they have they have donations, right? You can right. you can certainly donate. But there's no kind of revenue model. There's no sustainability. There's no, you know, and granted the sustainability is kind of in the open source ethos, but like, how can we, how can we kind of contribute? Uh, and, and the way we decided to do this is like, look, the applications that we host, right, we basically profit share. I mean, in, in a, in right. a kind of right. very low level kind of way, it's like, we're, we, you know, I, what do we say? Something like fifty percent of of net profit, right, goes back into the the applications um, to the percentage of which they're used, you know, stuff like that. So, so we we have an idea that you know, since w- these services are something that are provided by us, and and sure, you know, we're doing the work to get it up, to maintain it, to troubleshoot it, spin up the infrastructure, we're, we're paying for that. Um, on the back end, there is also other dues that we have to pay, right? And and I don't want to be neglectful of that. Um, so taking inventory of the stuff we use, in, uh, including Ansible, including Docker, you know, and, and those are things that we would have to kind of parse out and, and itemize out and say, hey, this is, this is, these are the dues we have to pay in right. order to make this an ethical type of company, right? And, and I could not operate in a company which didn't, didn't do, do that, that. Yeah. right? Um, I, I certainly couldn't operate one. Definitely. And I, I think speaking of some of the services we offer, some of the, some of the other items that are out there, uh, 
Very interesting one from Nextcloud. Uh, not a great look. <laughs> not a great look for them. Uh, they pushed out a 3.4.0 release for their desktop clients. And unfortunately, what ended up happening with this desktop client version was it just continued to pull f- files from the server. Now, it's been closed since, but this occurred right on two weeks ago. And I unfortunately have uh, someone I know that this happened to. They were running NextCloud, and basically they pulled down this newer version. They continue to just basically sync files. So it's been closed from... It's been closed now, but just kind of an unfortunate one to see because it, it you kind of lose that trust, right? After you start to see... This desktop client, they've got it out there. They've had it working for so long. It's been, I use the desktop client. I think it's fine. I think it's great. Mm-hmm. You see it, it just, they push out 3.4 and, you know, basically you're just killing, you're filling up disk space on your own workstation. You basically have to re-clean everything that's on uh, your desktop because it's just continuing to sync. So a little bit unfortunate to see, but I know they'll bounce right back. And this is why I never deploy dot zero bug fix releases to production. <laughs> and I'll tell you what, we we even at Orcompose we stay uh, minor release back just yep. to prevent from these exact issues from happening. Exactly, exactly. Because I've I've seen it all too often. I've seen it all too often, right? And and it it could be one of many different things, oh, including totally. your bash script not being item potent. Um, which I dredged up our, our next article from uh, 2019, but it had just surfaced uh, in the uh, circles that I run in. And, and I, I thought it was a really, really good article. It, it laid out some things that I've been doing, but really never took the time to systematize uh, and, and, and really just be aware of, right? So um, item potency for those of you don't, who don't know is, is something that, you know, kind of configuration management strives for. Um, the definition that they quote here is denoting an element of a set which is unchanged in value when multiplies are otherwise operated on by itself, uh, which means in the software world, if I run like a deploy script and then I run that same deploy script again, I can run it again without other stuff being overwritten. Right stuff doesn't get mangled up or you know we we don't plan on only ever having that script run once right because that's that's just a recipe for failure right because stuff happens right uh, it, it, it stuff happens in the most inconvenient time so being able to run it whenever we need is helpful and and that's kind of the approach that we take uh, especially with our you know um, our compose rules right they they are meant to be all item potent. Now, to be fair, they do act on services because we do want like a, a, a kick to those services. We do want them to restart. But at the end, you should end up, if you go into it with a working system, you should end up with a working system in the exact same way. Uh, so that being the goal of item potency, how does Bash achieve that? Well, there's a couple of tricks here. Um, so in order to create an empty file, bash has the touch command, uh, which if the file already exists, will simply update the mo- file's modification time and not over override anything else in it. Um, creating a directory with uh, make dir p and a, a ton of other uh, cool things here. Um, the one that I wasn't aware of is the mount point command um so that's that's not something and and that's something i've been struggling with a lot you know is it is it mounted do i do stuff to it do i try to you know and that's that's something that i think i will be taking away from this because you know going through the rest of these the author uh here is thinking in the in the same way that that i am uh so i definitely want to see if I can't start using that because I mean it's it's a good way to think it's it's a good methodology to use whenever I'm creating scripts is to say hey this should be item potent point blank totally 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 I'll tell you what I had um something I was running recently it was to clean 
files on my server. And one of the... Uh, regretfully, one of the folders got way too big. Sure enough, I have this script to clean it up when that happens. But basically, it was so big, I couldn't get RM to even work on it. So I had to pull the old <laughs> remove the whole directory itself and then copy back in the files that I needed to copy back in. It was so unfortunate. It could have been completely avoided. Now, where does this link back to item potency? I, of course, wrote up a, a small little bash script where if it happens again on the same directory, which I'm sure it will, I at least have that ability to now, all right, well, what did you do last time? Okay, you can do this to yep. go back and run the same thing over again. We have we do have a few community updates. I did not include it. There is an update for Run Deck. There are two updates, and I can only assume these are for Log4j. Just based on the fact that Run Deck is a Java application, I'm... Is it? It is. Uh, runs off Tomcat, Apache Tomcat. Okay. Uh, and then it's Java-based. So I can only assume they pushed out uh, releases for, I think, 3.4.7 and their 3.3 series. So okay. I can only assume both of these are related to remediations. No, that's right. That's right. You're right. You're right. Yep. I didn't see any release notes uh, I was fresh to it. It looked like when I was, I went, I went down to, I went to Git, GitHub to pull down the releases, check releases, and sure enough, they were fresh, eight hours new. There was nothing on the site that had mentioned it. That's right, because I was, I was looking at that, and I looked at that a bit ago, uh, and obviously, like you said, it was just fresh. Um, and then also this morning, there was more disclosures or, or you know, more vulnerabilities. Uh, announce or something like that. So I'm waiting for the fallout of that uh, before we look into stuff. But I think we were talking about in the activity section, we were talking how we obfuscate a lot of the variables uh, that we pass right. through, right? And like, why would someone do that? You know, we're, we're the only ones that have permission to see that. Why would we obfuscate it? Well, this well, is why. <laughs> this is why. This is why. I mean, this is defense in depth right and in depth means at every level that you can set up your systems to be secure and right. if obfuscating our passwords makes it just a little bit more secure perfect perfect yeah the other two we had here smaller i'm only going to briefly touch on them vault warden got a release it looks like it was just bug fixes and patches uh, that were pushed out He's still continuing to harp on, and I will harp on this as well. If you are self-hosting the image or pulling down that image from Docker Hub, quit using Bitwarden RS. That's your final warning. Use the Vault Warden image because that's what's out there now. And then the second update we had was for Bookstack. Again, just another minor one, but security releases. It sounded like this one, it, it, he kind of snuck it in there. It sounded like... Uh, <laughs> If the public API, if the public role was provided API access, then the API could be accessed in certain scenarios by non-authenticated users. So he kind of snuck that one in there, but it's kind of a big fix that he patched. So nothing else I saw. I don't know if you had anything else you wanted to add for community updates. Well, I was just looking at that same notification from him uh, in that. Uh, from excuse me from the vault warden team uh, in that we in order to pull down the image please start pulling down the vault warden vault image warden rather image. than the, right. the bit warden rs one um because i was going through and upgrading our migrating uh excuse me our services so 3.4 actually got released uh late in the night and uh was being rolled out after a couple bug fixes uh to the rest of the the application so um uh what got updated so accounting got updated um book stack uh bitwarden uh and nextcloud um all got version bumps and you can see that in the stable 3.4 release uh remind me to put those in the show notes as well and uh the what was the other thing 
Something about portal. Oh yeah, the the portal fix that we had talked about for the uh, in it for the zombie processes yeah. had to be back uh, cherry picked and backported into the stable three out of four release. So once that uh, once that was backported, that all worked uh, like a charm. The only thing uh, I ran into with that is that uh, some of the table names in the accounting database, uh, the config after migration was looking for a different prefix than what was there, so the fix was just to to update the prefix for it to be looking for. Um, but new instances didn't have that issue, so um, only existing instances would have to go in and, and change that config value, otherwise it's, it's all gravy. Uh, the only other update I had uh, this cycle uh, was our content walkthrough playlists, and that's because this took me way longer than it should have, than I wanted it to, uh, to create these. Um, and I'll, I'll kind of give a little inside baseball on those. So, so what we wanted to do is, is we wanted to be able to provide what's known in the industry as an ethical bribe in order to get people to sign up for the mailing list. Usually that comes in the form of, hey, you know, download our white paper and use your email to sign up in order to get access to it, you know, or, or, you know, it's, do this or do that or you know we have this 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 piece of content for you if you give us your email address and and that's that's known in in sales and marketing as an ethical bribe right um so we want to have one in our back pocket as well this has been something i've been thinking about for a while since we put out the podcasts why don't we cut the shows up into sections and that's been something right. we've ex been experimenting with you know jack's been really great at taking that on and saying yeah i'll take the the full episode i'll cut it in in shot cut and, and and do a video edit of it uh, and then we'll put those those out um so now we have those those sections going forward um why don't we just cut up our previous videos and like say pull out all of our Bitwarden content and and then that way if someone wants to learn more about Bitwarden or the the takes that we have on Bitwarden um, or the advice that we have on Bitwarden we can just point them to this playlist that will go through only all of our Bitwarden stuff including my integration sessions um, you know our your your integration discussions you know during the podcast and we clip those together into into a single playlist and and that flows very nicely um, and that's that's especially helpful for anyone who's who we're onboarding as, as a client you know he says that hey I want to I want to learn more about Bitwarden. I'm like well so we have several hours worth of content um, skim through these and then we can start from square two instead of square one Right, so we always we always want to be able to maximize uh, the time that we spend uh, because I think time is going to be our most constrained resource right. uh, going forward and and already. But uh, if we can if we can jumpstart that uh, by by providing this, I'm more than happy to. Uh, so that's that's going to be something available um, upon subscription to the mailing list or you know onboarding as a as a client of, of compositional enterprises, um, which I would hope at that point you'd already be set up to the mailing list. Right. But either way, um, uh, we we do have those available. Now, the the, the cool thing was, Jack, I'd, I'd given you that that script to to cut up uh, yeah. the the episodes. Quick, uh, yeah. The the unfortunate thing is there is a thing known as keyframes in videos, and these keyframes kind of sync up the the audio and video, right? So what you want to do is if you're going to cut something, you want to cut it on a keyframe. Key now, sure. when you export a video, it will re-encode all the keyframes for you. So like if you're editing it in shot cut, you don't have to worry about keyframes because it'll it'll do all that magic for you. But if I'm importing a video and I want to say cut it here, cut it here, do a fade and then and then concatenate them together, if I'm not doing those on keyframes, it's going to be all out of whack and nothing's going to work, right? So what I had to do is I had to re-encode everything with the correct keyframes, which I put at one second. So you're inserting a keyframe every, every second, one second. Yeah. of this video, which took forever because I went through most of our backlog. Most of our backlog ends up being Rundeck, Bitwarden, Canboard, or Nextcloud, right? Because those are the services that we've gone through. Those are the videos that I have for the integration session. So they, they pair well in a playlist and having those those 
many, many videos in our backlog. I had to import all of them. I just had a for loop going through and re-encoding each one of them. Yeah. I think it took my desktop something like a day and a half to record re re-encode, re-encode. all of them. Uh, and that was only after I had figured out that was the issue when I was scratching my head saying, why isn't the script What's working? What's going on? Yeah. Er my GERD, it worked for me yesterday on the same computer. So trying to figure that out, then re-encode them, then get them all uploaded and categorized and put in playlists. It was it was a lot bigger task than I thought it was going to be, but I'm so happy, so happy to have that. they're that out there. there. Oh, yeah. yeah. And... And there are other things coming down the pipe, but yeah, to have that up there, I was I was very happy. So if you're not incentivized by now, you should be, because that's how you're going to be able to get all this content, is if you sign up for the mailing list. And one thing I like about this is that it's not like the videos aren't out there for people, but we're curating it. Once right. again, it's your time to go through and cherry pick all those out, in order, by the way. Uh, to go through and, and watch all of them. This is nice and already and straightforward. Displayed. Yeah. Saves time. It's already so. there. Yep. Yep. So mailing list, if you don't already know, is at arcompose.com. Uh, right on the front page. Please, if you're, you're listening to this and you haven't done so yet, go ahead and just sign up. First name, email address. We're going to let you know when cool stuff like this is coming out. And for all of our content and any kind of updates we have. So, with that, though, I'll tell you what, we got a, a short integration discussion today. I didn't want to go way long. I, I, I included the API in there, and I just love the API too much as a developer. I was going to go way long, so I thought, all right, why don't I just start with user authentication and ACLs, the meat and potatoes of users in any service. So... Just to kick it off real quick, user authentication is a bit weird in Rundeck. And what I mean by that is essentially you can have users with no roles. They're not a user and they're not admins. So basically you, when you go to log in, I think you actually get an error saying you're not a part of any group. You're not a part of any role. You have nothing. You will, <laughs> You have an account. Congratulations. Here you go. So what you need to do is go in to, I'm going to have to pull it up here, the property file login module, which is essentially just a flat file. Now, you can use BC Crypt, you can use plain text, you can use MD5, you can use any kind of hash you want to hash your passwords. But essentially in this file, what you're getting is who are the users, what's their password again please encrypt it and what's their role so pretty simple on the basis that once you create these users that are out there they have defined scopes basically if you're an admin you essentially can define a role for you have access to everything as a user now you kind of get into these ACLs, right? You have, you get into your access control list. Who has ac- access to what? Why do they have access to this? Who gets it? Who needs it? Why? Uh, before I get into the ACLs though, there are, a. am I'm, I'm, I hate saying a bunch, but there are quite a few other user authentication modules available. Uh, and most of them are based on, are you going to have to correct me? JAS, J A A S, not, Java as a service. I think it's Java authentication and authorization service. Um, oh, I hope I hope we never end up with Java as a service. <laughs> oh, no. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but essentially, that there are a bunch more modules. Uh, LDAP, Active Directory, I think it has its own that is used. I know the Enterprise Edition also touches on the actual ability within run deck to kind of control these. Uh, but I'm not going to get into those. I don't want to dive too deep into that. Essentially what you get on your server though, as I explained earlier is a flat file where you can add users, remove users. And what we want to be able to do with portal is from portal. You're going to have in within the run deck service configuration, you're going to be able to add and remove users and at a base level. That's all you need to know. Right. But on the back end, essentially what we're going to be doing is, 
modifying this flat file. And of course, we'll be using encryption for this. Uh, now, to get into the ACLs, <laughs> let me take a breath here because the ACLs in Rundeck are and can be as granular as you want, as complex as you want. You can limit people to doing one thing. You can limit them to doing everything. It's at a basis level. What I first titled this podcast was CRUD, Create, Update, Read, Destroy. And I named that for the API. But now that I look at these ACLs, I might have to go back and rename it one more time for all the availability basically on jobs who's allowed to run what what projects they have access to who's you know th this entire scope of roles and permissions that are available within run deck uh so i will read the basic a what is an acl now that you're probably wondering uh run deck access control policy grants users and user groups certain privileges to perform actions against run deck resources like projects jobs nodes commands and the api Every action requested by users evaluated by the Rundeck authorization system and logged for reporting and auditing purposes. So not only is the ACL doing that, and when I say doing that, I say authorizing and authenticate or authorizing users for that, but it's logging and auditing them. And once they get their log4j fixed, you'll be able to pull all these logs. Uh, no, I just had to put that in there for relevancy, but oof. Uh, there's along with the ACLs you get just instead of just having to manage every single user you can add users to groups and then manage those groups accordingly and what really stuck out to me again I think as we talked about with permissions is you don't want someone on we'll just say develop your development team with access to with admin access to entire systems right you just want them to be able to do maybe a handful of things handful of scripts and if you create the jobs for them you can grant them that permission to only run those jobs and i think where we found it the most helpful as i talk about it for compositional enterprises in the r compose is our api read run key and basically what this means is with our api access essentially what we do is we give portal every every instance of portal we give a read run key now I think if we gave it and admin key that means if you're able to skillfully craft a request over to the run deck server using that key pulled from the environment which would be pretty impressive if you could do well if you could do it even via the login that'd be even more impressive <laughs> uh you would have full access to the systems to now you wouldn't have access to every system, but you'd have access to the Rundex, the, our Rundex server itself, and yeah, and, and that and could be self. Key can do a lot of things. That's yeah. self-destructive, right? That could mean we're just. That could mean I'm blowing away every job you have. Now you won't be able to access the way we have it set up. You won't be able to access other instances, um, but you could blow away every job on that Rundex server if you have admin access to it. You can create users, add users, remove users, but. ACLs prevent this, and they do this with our read run key. We define a group. We say, hey, this is our, we define it at a, at a user level. We say, hey, this is, you know, our, I think we call it our compose API, our RO uh, for read only, and then we give it the permissions to just read and run, read output from jobs and run jobs. So they also have, a cool little tr trick with the ACLs and it's the last thing I'll touch on. Basically the ACLs are managed through a YAML file and what I found really cool is this YAML file, the server does not need to be restarted or the service does not need to be restarted. Essentially, I don't know if it's what they have going on in there, if it's some kind of cron job or what, but they have a YAML file and every, I think two minutes it said, it'll refresh and update from that YAML file. So an, a nice little feature uh, that's available. I did link also the scopes and everything out there uh, on Rundex documentation because they just have great documentation on 
So speaking of their documentation, yeah. Uh, if you refresh that page in Bookstack, uh, I actually added a section called "Where Can I Edit the Policy." Oh yeah, and yeah, yeah, yeah. I pointed to specifically for end users, right? Because I mean, what are you really realistically going to have access to? You're going to have access to the the front end, the web service. Sure, right? sure. So I, I linked to their ACL policy GUI. And that walks you through um, where to find these access controls, so you can look at them for yourself. Uh, how to edit them, uh, how to list them. You know the wizard that it walks you through. You know new ones or, or modifications. So there's there's just a lot here, and and there is I wouldn't say a lot of hand holding, right? But you know it's it's a lot easier than a blank file. Well, with the UI for sure. I'm just look, I'm just now looking at that, and it is definitely a lot easier than just, hey, we just need a YAML format. Good luck. <laughs> yes. Now in the in the, the 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 end of it, I mean that's what it spits out. But this will be able to to kind of give you those guardrails uh, that make. Th- th- I mean that that is the hallmark of a GUI. Right. It's it's there right. to give you those guardrails to make right. this easy. Yeah. You don't have to be an expert on YAML files, what context, you, you know, all the groups and users that need access to what. You don't have to be the expert on that because the GUI's there. It just, it looks like here it's showing, all right, hit your drop down button. What group does this apply to? And you're like, oh, my security team. Okay. You click that. What access do they need? All right, you just need, you know, the security team will regenerate. We just want to be able to regenerate tokens for users. All right, give them the access to that job, and guess what? They're off. Rather than futzing around learning, okay, what does the word context mean on this YAML file right now? It's like, uh, hang on, let me refer to someone who might actually know. But the GUI's there. I don't know if you have anything you want to touch on in the GUI specifically. I, I'm glad you brought it up that it's there. <laughs> yeah, just just that it's there and it's going to make your life a whole lot easier. But that is all I have for ACLs and user authentication. I'll tell you what, don't. I'm saying right now, don't take my uh, API next week. I'm hoping you don't. <laughs> okay, I'll leave that for you then. But that is all I have for uh this week's integration discussion with acls and user authentication it only makes us wonder the future of these two hard questions uh, who are you and what do you have access to and i think with that i'm going to hand it over to andrew for this week's grab bag topic yeah so this this week's grab bag topic uh is as jack was alluding to is it's all kind of wrapped up in, you know, the essence of what is the future tech, you know, that that we've all been hearing about. Um, so, so the the title here is Neil Stevenson's Metaverse is not a use case for NFTs. Uh, so, I, I guess I wanted to start off with, you know, Jack, what's what's your hot take of of NFTs, right? And and really, have you read any of Neil Stevenson's work? I have read Snow Crash. Okay. Uh, I my take on NFTs is they're kind of BS. <laughs> uh, well, they're at, complicated. At, we can at this uh, point think, in time. Um, I think I don't think, and I think the reason I say they're BS at this point is because art isn't a great format for them now. Non fungible tokens on their own, I think, is it going to be a good idea. I just don't think art is right for it. It's that's that's a very nuanced answer to a very difficult question. So yeah, no thanks, thanks for that. Um, Snow Crash, as you mentioned, uh, being one of Neil Stevenson's work, uh, actually the the one that really cemented him uh, as a major science fiction writer. Um, it, it actually, I, I have a little, little factoid here. It appeared on Time Magazine's list of 100 all-time best English language novels written since 1928. So in, in almost 100 years, or 1923, excuse me, in almost 100 years, uh, that, that's, it's, it's still among the top 100. In, in you know, what is this book that has stood the test of time so well? Um, 
the, the synopsis of the book goes, In the not-too-distant future, a world where the mafia controls pizza delivery, the United States exists as a patchwork of corporate franchise city-states, and the internet, incarnate as the metaverse, looks something like last year's hype would lead you to believe it should. Uh, so, obviously, we want to start talking about the metaverse because there has been all this rumbling about Facebook's metaverse, and I wanted to see how NFTs kind of fit into that, right? So, to, to continue uh, on the background of this book, um, they go on, In reality, Hero Protagonist, and yes, that is the name of the main character of the book, Hero Protagonist, delivers pizza for Casa Nostra. But in the metaverse, he's a warrior prince, last of the solo hackers, and the greatest sword fighter in the world. Now he's racing along the neon-lit streets, the skirts of his black leather kimono flapping, on a search-and-destroy mission for the shadowy virtual villain threatening to bring about infopocalypse. When his best friend fries his brain on a new designer drug called Snow Crash, and his beautiful brainy ex-girlfriend asks for his help, what's a guy... With a name like that to do, he rushes to the rescue. So it's a it's a great book. Trust me, this this I, I think the summary was very well written. Um, it's it is a, a almost a parody to to some level of other kind of hacker type stories. Like the, they they uh, Neil steals a lot of different tropes and uh, really greatly exaggerates the whole, you know, villain, uh, hero villain motif. Uh, and and it's just it's just very enjoyable to read. Um, a, a couple of things I wanted to highlight out of this uh, is that similar to Cyberpunk, or some have called it Cyberbug 2077, uh, most territory is owned by private organizations and entrepreneurs. Um, I don't know if you've heard the rumbling, but there's a lot about, you know, secessionism and Amazon, you know, creating its own cities. And, you know, so, so you're starting to hear kind of rumblings of that. So that, that was a red flag to me. And I was like, well, I, I think I've heard of this before. Um, the main character is hero protagonist, uh, who, like he said, is a, is a pizza delivery boy by day and the originator of the metaverse by night. So the, the metaverse was the other big thing, uh, that, that has been in the news lately. And, and we'll touch on that in a second. Um, his, his task obviously is to, to find the origins of the virus and stop the evil men from using it for evil. Like I said, it's very big on the tropes here. The 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 kind of meta parts of it that are interesting to me besides the whole like they go into different you know sumerian language and texts and you know how text can be treated as code and like override the bios of the human wetware brain and so so, so it's it's very it's very science fictiony to the point where it's almost nauseating but still enjoyable uh the 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 interesting part comes in, in in two bits here. The first being economics. So uh, I, I just pulled this from Wikipedia because I think it's a great synopsis. But they go, uh, hyperinflation has sapped the value of the U.S. dollar to the extent that trillion dollar bills are nearly disregarded. And quadrillion dollar note, nicknamed the Gipper, is the small standard kind of bill, like a, like a $20, $20 bill nowadays. This hyperinflation was caused by the government overprinting money, anyone hear that before, due to loss of tax revenue, as people increasingly began using electronic currency, wink wink, which they exchange in untaxable encrypted online transactions, um, for which Ross Ulbricht is still in jail. For physical transactions, most people resort to alternate currencies such as yen or Kong bucks, the official currency of Mr. Lee's Greater Hong Kong, once again, privately owned territory there. Uh, hyperinflation has also negatively affected much of the rest of the world, uh, resulting in waves of def desperate refugees from Asia who cross the Pacific in rickety ships hoping to arrive in North America. So you have a lot of things that, that parallel, you know, kind of, hinting at what we've been seeing lately um especially uh like the electronic currency this was written in the 90s so i mean there was no such thing as bitcoin hash cash was still kind of like a a, a a thought at that point so you have to say all right how you know what what kind of led him to to this place and, and what can we learn from this? Um, and then he starts to describe his version of the metaverse. And this this has been plagiarized almost everywhere throughout the internet history. Like this is 
this is the canonical description of like a VR utopia, right? This is yeah. this is a total immersion. I'm going to go in, uh, you know, into the matrix and everything that happens in the matrix happens for real kind of thing. And, you know, so so this is kind of where all of those tropes started. Um, so he he coined this phrase. Um, he says it's a successor to the in- uh, the internet, uh, and it really constitutes his vision of how a reality-based internet might evolve in the near future. Um, so talking about it here, uh, it resembles a massive multiplayer online game. The metaverse is populated by user-controlled avatars, as well as system demons. Uh, and I didn't know that avatar as a like computer like representation of yourself yeah. was really popularized with this book as well. So, I mean, this kicked off a lot of different things. This, this is why it was in the top 100 books in the past or yeah, in the past almost a hundred years now. Um, so although there are public access metaverse terminals in reality, using them carries a social stigma among metaverse denizens in part because of the low visual representations of themselves, such as low quality avatars. And here's uh, an important thing here. Status in the metaverse is a function of two things. Access to restricted environments, such as the Black Sun, which is like a nightclub, virtual nightclub. Um, And technical acumen, which is often demonstrated by the sophistication of one's avatar. Uh, so it's it's somewhat of a meritocracy kind of merged with a relationship driven hierarchy as as kind of any social um, network would be. Uh, now, what was interesting to me is that Ready Player One also popularized this idea of the metaverse um, in a similar type of, you know, everything's going to crap, you know, everyone's isolated from each other, you know, every, you know, people are having a hard time connecting and social problems are rampant, e- economic stagnation is happening, you know, the, all these bad things, right? Uh, they say here, the primary escape for most people in, in Ready Player One is a virtual universe called the Oasis, which is accessed with a visor and haptic glove. So once again, we're talking about like a full kind of immersion. Um, it functions both as an MMORPG and as a virtual society, with its currency being the most stable currency in the world, right? And, you know, Bitcoin maxis could only hope that be the case for them. So we have here two kind of representations. One is, is like the, the, the canon, right? This is where it kind of it all originated. And then in Ready Player One, they also describe a, a metaverse type scenario and i think that came out what 2018 2019 something like that the movie the movie Ready did Player yeah One? the movie was yeah pretty the recent. book came out in 20 2011 yeah um but we go back into you know facebook having changed its name to meta and why did it do that well it wanted to kind of create the metaverse what is the metaverse well i i i've tried to lay that out for you here so we have an understanding of what the metaverse is uh what are some other implementations of metaverses metaverses whatever that have already come to fruition well the first one imvu we actually talked about back in episode 11 when we were talking about the lean startup a lot of their examples uh eric reese's examples was pulled from uh, his experience at IMVU, grabbing customer feedback and doing iterative processes, releasing early and often, yada, yada, yada. So there is a lot of of metaverse um, history online. I mean, I think IMVU was released in like 2004, right? And it is it is as simple as you go create your online avatar, go shopping in your online avatar, do meet people, have conversations, do stuff as your online avatar, right? I mean, this is, it functions basically as an MMORPG, right? Sure. Um, and, and I would say it's, it's similar to an MMORPG. Uh, in, in fact, that probably that's the best way to think about it, except for the fact that there's no like, war or fighting component to it it's more just like social life rather than you know kind of like a medieval struggle with demons and villains right you know littered around the world right so it's it's still just like on a server you're logging into a server you know in a world and people are like walking around socializing it's like, yeah 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 you're, you're simply just socializing 
another popular one is Second Life. So that's yeah. been around uh, forever as well. Um, and then obviously Facebook's Metaverse uh, that they just came up with. Now, if you think about those three that I just outlined, right, that isn't something that's universal, not something that's decentralized. It bears almost no resemblance to the cyberpunk culture or the decentralization push uh, that comes with, you know, blockchain and cryptocurrency and, and all this kind of uh, privacy focused tech that's really taken the spotlight since call it the Snowden revelations, right? So how does this fit into NFTs? Well, we understand that these companies want to utilize NFTs some way. But first, we have to kind of understand what NFTs are. Um, and one of the uh, phrases that gets bandied about uh, is, aren't they basically just JPEGs that you can right-click and save, right? <laughs> yes, but. <laughs> <you know>. <laughs> right. <laughs> yes, but. Uh, and and there's, a, there's a lot to go in. Um, it, it's and, and I have a lot of notes here, so I don't know how much I'm going to be able to touch on. But I did want to highlight a couple things. So, so one of the things is, are NFTs stored on chain? And it's the same answer. It's, it's yes, but, right? So not all NFTs are stored in the same way. One of the main features of NFTs is their provable ownership, verifiability, and provenance. As we know, this is achieved by creating NFTs on decentralized blockchains, such so as Ethereum. But here comes a problem. Although these beautiful high resolution pictures, if we're just talking about, you know, JPEGs sure. of apes or penguins are cool, there's no way the image files representing them can be stored on the blockchain itself. This leads to a situation where most NFTs only include a link to the actual art and its metadata, which is then stored off chain. There's a whole range of options when storing data off chain. Some projects use centralized servers, other try to improve the situation by uploading their metadata and art to IPFS. Other solutions like Arweaver are also gaining traction. Uh, generative art and certain low resolution NFTs are some of the exceptions here as they can be entirely stored on chain. Uh, so that is from a, um, oh, who's that by? Uh, Finematic um, video. So that is a YouTube channel that goes through a lot of NFTs, DeFi, blockchain. Uh, they do kind of like little explainer videos. And that's probably the most uh, concise uh, description of the issue with where is this NFT actually stored. And, and, and the answer really is unless you're part of the exceptions, which proves the rule, the rule being that the NFTs are stored off chain. So you come back and, you know, all right, cool. What? What is actually alluring about these, right, by the way? Well, one of the, the things that is is proposed is that you can prove ownership of these things, right? And sure. and proving ownership is a very loaded phrase. Like what does ownership mean? You know, what what does prove mean? Right. And 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 then you really have to get deep into what this is and and um then we get into like what is their use? Right. Uh, what you know, what how can you show it off? You know, if we, we go back to Neil Stevenson's metaverse, right, one of the things that was tied with status was kind of their their avatar, which right. really did reflect back on their technical acumen. Um, but still, I mean, owning a owning a, an NFT does give you some kind of props in or, you know, some some legitimacy uh, in, in the crypto sphere. Right. So. Uh, what people come up with is profile picture NFTs or, or PFP NFTs. P PFP just meaning profile, profile picture. picture. Right? Sure. It's not it's not that complicated. But uh, a lot of people have used that profile picture everywhere they are online. So in in Telegram, in WhatsApp, in Signal, in Twitter, in you know Mastodon, wherever they're going to use this PFP NFT as their profile picture, right? Um, and, and then we come back to, while this is great and all, can't people just save your image and use it as their Twitter profile picture? Well, yes, they can. <laughs> <laughs> but since NFTs are on the blockchain, it's easy to prove who's the original owner. And here's where it gets interesting. 
Uh, and this is from PFP NFTs, all you need to know um, from Airdrop Alert. And they say, moreover, Twitter developers announced that they are working on a verification tool so Twitter can verify ownership of the NFT. The owner will get a small Ethereum logo on their PFP, similar to the blue checkmark icon that influencers have. Hmm. Okay. How about that? What if your PFP isn't owned on Ethereum? What if you own this somewhere else? You know, not on Twitter, right? How do you verify it other places? And what what if you've what if you've chosen to host the metadata and image somewhere else? And 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 that's what information is in the blockchain, right? If it's not in one of Twitter's approved registrars, right? At this point, you're like, wait a second. So I have a centralized developer, mental, you know, monitoring a centralized service requiring centralized authentication tools to prove my decentralized ownership of a copyable image. I'm like, how many more hoops do we have to jump through before we're legally declared a surf circus? Like this, <laughs> this is getting a little ridiculous, right? So, so to bring it all together, if we think of the metaverse, metaverse in St in, in Neil Stevenson's vision is this kind of federated place where everything kind of is is fair game right except for the societies in which you choose to operate right you, you can you can slice it up as much as you want but if you can't hack your way in or if you're not granted privilege in you're 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 not getting in there right um what kind of works universally and and he answers that question in a in a hacker type way in in a way that you know only people I've allowed in can get in or, you know, we've we've granted this only to a specific number of users. But it's not like that loses all of its impetus once you go outside the realm of whatever. This is, you know, anything that needs to operate on the blockchain needs to operate in the real world, too. Right. So so how do we get from NFTs are literally copy and pasteable and only enforceable inside of centralized environments to something that's actually feasible to to function as a non-fungible token. It is something that provides non-fungibility. So I copied a lot from uh let's see expensitivity.com. I've never been there before. But wow, was this an amazingly good write-up. Like, blew, blew me away how in-depth and considered this was. So props to them for doing this. Actually, who's, who's, who's the author? Who's the author? Because they did a really, really good job. I mean, I was glued to my screen for like 20 minutes reading and rereading this. Uh, Bernard Fixer did a great job. Um, so... He has a lot more to say than I'm going to be able to touch on right now. Uh, but a couple of things I wanted to pull out of his article. He actually goes through how to make an NFT on eBay. And he kind of, it's, it's tongue in cheek because at the end of it, you've created an NFT, which is a non-fungible token without the use of any kind of blockchain whatsoever, right? Which is his entire argument in the first place. And, and I don't disagree with him, but... If we, we come back to this this idea of having a social digital marketplace, right? Having this ecosystem built around it, how how can this work or or will it, right? So we have to say, uh, he brings up the which blockchain question, which we already go through. Um, he starts talking about uh, Jack Dorsey's first tweet on Twitter, right? The, pr uh, the previous CEO of Twitter. Uh, he says, we have no technological guarantees that Dorsey's Genesis tweet will not be retokenized by him as an NFT. Sure. Instead, the only constraint on pro proliferation is Dorsey's promise not to do otherwise and the social norms that would hold him to that promise. He's already sold one. What is to prevent him from selling another or, or retokenize it? Nothing. There is no technological guarantee. We talk about the blockchain. You know, we, we now have an immutable ledger that extends back in time. That's a technological guarantee. That is a cryptographically secure guarantee. We don't have that same kind of guarantee 
for any of these NFTs being minted. And it's like you said, uh, it, it can just be retokenized. Yeah. Same picture or same, same content. Same picture. Whatever you want to make it. Or on a different blockchain. Right. Or or on a different server. I mean, it, there's... Or under a different minting company. Because there are companies who will do this for you and then say, no, 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 you can't, update, you can't upload it again. All right, well, I'll go to Joe Somewhere Schmo's else. printing Down the street, minting yeah. office. Yeah. And, and, and have him tokenize it for me. Because he's got no moral constraints. He's a... He's a shady character, uh, so it, there's there's no technical technological guarantees uh, on on any on any fungibility or not fungibility, but any you know scarcity for these NFTs. Um, let's see. So he, he he had he had a couple good examples. One of them uh, revolved around uh, a, a digital photo. And different ways to trade that. Um, he was talking about copyright, and you know what, what can be claimed uh, with an NFT. Uh, and it turns out if you don't have a social institution around it, or like copyright law, right, you're not going to be able to claim anything with it. It, you know, it it doesn't mean it doesn't mean anything. Uh, I think he said. Uh, he was giving a, a hypothetical situation where he he just kind of reprinted um, this this image that he had, right? Um, he said, having saturated Rarible, which is one of these kind of vendors who will mint NFTs for you, with my NFT of the Iowa Democratic primary, I could go to any other NFT marketplace that requires no prior approval of its users and do the same exercise there, uploading the PNG of the Iowa Democratic primary there as an NFT. Granted, word of my unbridled proliferation of the same NFT might get around and ruin any chance of turning a profit with it, but that's not the point, right? He said the point is that with such unbridled proliferation, with its assault on scarcity, it has no technological solution, right? As a consequence, all the actual content of an NFT, in other words, what makes it collectible, artworthy, or of any interest, will typically reside off the Ethereum blockchain. Uh, and this is kind of diving into more of these these minting companies, right? Um, he said, but where? Well, in the case of the NFT I created at Rarible, it will reside at Rarible with what's on the Ethereum blockchain simply registering the NFT and pointing to Rarible for the PNG that's at the heart of this NFT. And he made a good point here, right? He said, so my NFT to exist at all must reside in two places, namely the Ethereum blockchain and the Rarible website. If either fails, I lose my NFT. This is this is something that's just not secure. Right. Right? It's not tech. How many companies did we see go under in the dot com bust? Right? You know, when 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 all of that took a downturn, you know, how many companies are, are still around today? Not not many. Right. Not many. What what happens if there's another? Right? What happens if anything happens? Right? You you don't have a resiliency system that has been, trust me, probed to death uh, like blockchain technology, right? The the amount of world-ending scenarios that I have seen postulated online where the main concern of the asker is, will I still have my Bitcoin? I'm like, dude, you, you, you better be <laughs> happy you still have both your arms at that point. <laughs> <laughs> like man and 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 the answer typically is yes there's a way to kind of consolidate all of that at the end of the day were everything to you know spontaneously return to normal i i don't see any type of guarantees like that from nfts not in the least he says for one, uh, so getting get into the the very last section of this, um, you know, talking about talking about we're, we're not giving the same guarantees as as with stuff on the blockchain. He kind of goes into well, why then do we need a blockchain at all? And he gives a hypothetical, oh, actually a, a real world scenario. I think it was like the most NF, expensive NFT ever sold. It was like a. a Montage, not montage, but um, mosaic of different pictures put together. 
uh, and and he's t- here talking about the uh, exchange of that you know signed over to um, Sundarasan, um, who was the the investor who who bought it from um, Christie's, being the the auction house uh, Christie's of that NFT. So he said that it was signed over to him on the Ethereum blockchain, or any blockchain for that matter, seems unessential. Christie's and Sundarasan, for instance could have set up a private public cryptography key for themselves, and Christie's could have then signed over every day's, the image every day's, from its key to the purchaser. The public keys and the signing of the artwork using private keys would have been noted far and wide, given all the public attention to this sale, and the purchaser could have paid for it in any currency mutually agreed upon by the buyer and the auction house. Blockchain could thus have been sidelined. And he finishes up with this. Ownership on the Ethereum blockchain is not ownership in the real world. Real world ownership is ownership with the force of law behind it. Ethereum blockchain based ownership is purely conventional ownership. It only applies within the Ethereum ecosystem and nowhere outside. To conclude, I think I'll, I'll, I'll end with this. Uh, and and this, is, this is my take. My take is that NFTs are legitimized to the extent that their utilization is confined to a socially defined ecosystem whose rules are centrally enforced. And if you go back to any functioning representation of any kind of metaverse or, or any kind of real universe that's never going to be a sustainable case for anything. The, the universe is subject to entropy and decay and, and rust, as I found out on my car. And, and it's just not a place that is, is going to be kind to these things that are so flighty and, and so error prone. And you need real assurity and we look we look everywhere for that kind of assurity. We're, we're, we're risk adverse, right? And there's there's many reasons why why we are. But the thought is, if if we can if we can contribute and we can be a part of something sustainable, something bigger than us, something that could outlive us, right? Then that may be something worth investing time in, investing money in, investing energy in. And, you know, putting together our Compose, I, I looked out on the landscape and I said, look, the applications that I'm interested in have been around yeah. for a long time. And I have no doubt that they will continue to be around far after I have either outgrown them or they have outlived me, whatever happens first. Uh, and, and... In seeking for this, you know, what what can we do to be a part of something bigger than ourselves? How can we contribute to something bigger than ourselves, right? That is core. That is fundamental to the mission of what we're doing here at Our Compose, right? So if that's something you believe in, right, you you should you should well you should be way beyond signing up for the mailing list uh, by that point, right. right? This should be something you should be giving us a call about. You know, how how do I get myself on this kind of sustainability wave right you know people want to talk about sustainable farming sustainable agriculture you know what this is sustainable computing and and i don't think we've talked about that before nfts aren't aren't sustainable i I think i've laid out the case for that pretty well today if you want to be part of something sustainable be a part of our compose and with that we hope you enjoyed this episode of our compose cast thank you be safe And we'll see you all in two weeks. Bye, everybody.